Um, okay, so I just want to point out that we are doing a good bazillion of these <laughs> sessions in different themes and all of the recordings when they're recorded and the um, the, the PowerPoint slides and the additional resources, anything that we reference, the, the articles, the journal articles, all of those uh, materials, the videos are all being housed on this uh, special interest workshop session site uh, for you to refer back to. You're welcome to go back and uh, look all over. And sometimes I cross reference. So like yesterday I was giving the large classes session and I talked about this session um, because we're gonna going a little more in depth about the actual assessments uh, today. Um, so for those of you who are la here last week, I used the forms tool for you to vote and you chose your uh, top three that you wanted uh, us to cover today. Um, I'm, I think it's not showing all of them. There we go. I didn't know that I turned on um, animations there. That's funny. Okay, so the red ones are the top three that you voted for. So open book, peer assessment, and reflective paper. So that's what we're going to cover today. I know I promised that I would tell you sooner, but I'm sorry. I'm really just doing these just in time. So please bear with me. Um, I do want to point out that we are always available at EdTech at Brock U if there's something specific that you want to learn about right away. And a couple of you have reached out to me individually, and I'm happy to follow up as soon as I get through this little rush this week. We're going to do some, we're going to dig in and work individually with you. And that's something that we're always happy to do. Um, I do want to point out that the other three uh, uh, research and essay writing, mind mapping, infographic were pretty close. So I was tempted to, to put them into, but I think three is really the most manageable for the amount of time we have. Um, and I will give you, a, we will do a runoff vote. So if you want to uh, put your votes back into those, then we can cover that next week or we can design since next week is our last week together. We can really, you can give me some feedback on what you really need to know as a whole group. Um, and then we recommend that you uh, branch off when we start building individually. Uh, so the session agenda for today, we're going to talk about open book take home exams. I'm going to try and balance the pedagogical with the actual technical. Um, that was some of the feedback that I got uh, before was that you kind of want to know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get the pedagogical. But how do I do it? So I'm going to try and balance it without overwhelming you because there's a lot of little tweaky, uh, clicky things that it really doesn't make great for a great session <laughs> um, that some people are like, oh my gosh, okay. Um, so I'm going to just give you a broad overview of how to do it. And then when you want to get in deep into your specific context, we will definitely take you through. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about peer evaluation and reflective papers. Um, and so uh, is Raymond here? Raymond has been really helpful actually giving me feedback. And he said, why didn't you talk about the difference between formative and summative? And I was like, good point, Raymond. I should probably point that out. So there's different, there's different reasons that we assessed. Uh, so there's for learning, there's of learning, and there's as learning. So if you think of for learning, that's the formative. That's what happens throughout the term when you're kind of like checking in, you're, you're testing, you may be doing those uh, low stakes tests that we talked about last uh, week. Um, you're doing some kind of reflective paper, even the discussions that you do in class, those are forms of formative learning. You're like, are you getting it? And it's and it's um, and you're getting feedback on how they're doing. Typically, the summative assessment is what happens at the end of the term, and that's usually what is the final exam. And then sometimes um, we know that research shows that actually taking a test can be a form of learning. So it can you could use assessment as learning, as an activity, but that's when we recommend it uh, be low stakes, uh, allow people to do it multiple times, and, um, and we can talk about how you can design for that. So um, a lot of people want to know about the take home exam, the open book exam, and that's a form of a summative. So that's going to be of learning. It's going to happen at the end of the term. Um, and so we want to talk about what that could look like. I'm just going to remind you, I keep showing the slide. Um, we want to kind of uh, be framing open book and um, take home exams as authentic. So we want to engage students in their own learning. We want to connect it to real life situations. We want to forge relationships between what they've learned before in other courses or in their own life and their own knowledge and skills to what they've developed in this particular course. And we would like to provide multiple pathways so there's a lot of perspectives. And that way you are addressing the academic integrity issue because you're designing it so that it can have those multiple perspectives or not just one right answer. Um, if it's something that you can look up um, then it makes it really difficult to kind of, you're like, okay, well, don't cheat. Don't look that question up. So we're looking, we're designing these open books so you can look it up. And so how can we do that? 
So open book uh, exams, they don't test memory. Um, so they test your ability to find and use information for problem solving and develop well-structured and well-presented arguments and solutions. Many of you already do this. This is what happens in the, the final essay that is due. Um, this happens in, in projects all the time. Um, but there are ways that you can do this in an exam where you just have some key guiding questions and there's some considerations we wanted to go over. I just want to point out though, if mem I do not want to discount the importance of memory. You cannot do, you cannot build and do higher level learning unless you know the basics. But if that is what is a key outcome for you is that somebody needs to know particular terms or terminology or facts, um, that's where assessment as learning comes in really helpful. And you can use those low stakes, high frequency, multiple choice tests to kind of allow people lots of practice to, to engage in it until they get perfect. And you could have like a whole question bank. And so you could design that all the way through the term um, and that builds towards the final take home exam. So some considerations, this is from a guide that there's a link there that has a lot of other uh, material available for you. But when you design your questions for your open book exams, we're looking at interpretation or application. So you're not just asking about, um, you know, those questions that, that could be just looked up. You're like, no, we already knew this, we covered this, refer to your notes, everything that you've done so far, how does this apply in this context? And so you're asking those higher level questions that actually are quite contextualized based on the individual individual and their learning experience. Um, a lot of you use case-based exam questions, and so you could tweak those as well so they could have a multiple perspectives. Um, so when you, when you create these questions, you want to actually think and you want to pull upon or draw upon the work that they've done throughout the term. So you're actually saying, you're not saying don't look at your stuff, you're saying look at it, uh, remember when we did this, and, and how would you apply it in this context? And so um, we always ask when you're designing your exam, what skills and knowledge are you assessing? So try and get to the core of that when you're, when you're creating these. Um, and a way that you can build this in is you can reward ongoing engagement. So this is something that is a challenge. We've been uh, working with faculty for years and it's sort of like the students aren't showing up to class, they're not doing this, they're not doing that. How, are, how do I ensure engagement? So this doesn't matter whether it's online or face-to-face. -face. How do you re reward this ongoing engagement with your, with your course material? So you could actually, so what um, typically used to happen in smaller seminars is there's like a participation grade. This could be shifted to be like, how are you engaging with the material? Are you taking notes? Are you using the forums? We talked about forum posts last week. Um, and so you don't have to do um, micromanaging of all of that, uh, you know, like grading the notes every week, but it could be something that you have them submit as an appendix for their final take home exam. They could reference their own note taking as they went through the entire course. And again, as I said before, those low stakes quizzes, they could actually scaffold towards that take home exam. So those things that are really important about memorizing, um, recall, all those, all those things that they need to know those terms, those can be done all the way through and leading up to, okay, you know these terms, but how does it apply in this context and provide some new and unique different ways of showing, um, of having them demonstrate what they've learned. Um, so on the technical front, I definitely, rec there's a, a tendency for people to want to use the tests and quizzes tool for a take home exams because it's, you're thinking exams, I want to use a test and quizzes tool. I actually think the assignment tool is much more appropriate. Um, it allows you to, it's a link to the grade book. It allows you to kind of set up the parameters and I'll just show you what that looks like. You can set the due date, you can set an accept until date, you can make it a constrained amount of time. Some people do it over a 24 hour period as opposed and they only open it at a certain date if it is something that you didn't want them to see all the way through. I'm of the uh, uh, teaching philosophy that I, I want my students to know what we're working towards so I, I allow them to see what that's going to look like right from the outset so that they're always working towards it. But if it's something that you, you know, no, I just want them to know it at this regular date at the end of term, that's fine. You can open it up, it can be available. You tell them when they're gonna be able to see it. They um, work on their assignment and they can submit it as an attachment. I will note um, that Turnitin does have, uh, there is an integration to Turnitin. Uh, probably many of you already know that. It's just a little checkbox and uh, it does do phrase matching. Um, I'll give my usual ethical caveat that um, I, you know, it is a third party tool and you do need to put um, 
in your course outline that you are going to be using Turnitin if that's something that you're going uh, to be using just to let students know and they do have the right if they have any kind of a reasonable objection and there are reasonable objections of why you would not want to use Turnitin then you have to provide an alternate format and that's the kind of thing that where you provide your notes or you're providing your rough drafts all of those uh, all of those things building towards that final exam could be something that you could build in anyway, and maybe you wouldn't even need to use the, the turn it in uh, um, checkbox feature. Um, and I will always also say context matters. Your course is very specific, um, talking to people in accounting and psychology here. So we have very different disciplines. So if you want some help designing what your what you think it should look like, then please reach out. Um, Ed Dev is uh, Leanne and um, and Natalie and and me and Elisa will probably be helping a little bit too. Um, so we can help you design specific to your context. These are some broad kind of general guidelines, but I really can't give you a this is what your exam should look like um, I wish I could um, but that that's those are just sort of the things that I want you to consider when you're designing so then we're thinking about um, formative assessment going back to the for learning because um, a lot of people wanted to know about peer evaluation and this is a great example of how formative assessment can um, be used for learning. So this is something else that can prepare people for their final. So whatever that final culminating assignment is, whether it's a project or an essay, or even if it is that take home exam, this gives students an opportunity to kind of try it out, get it done sooner, um, share and give feedback uh, to each other. And that can be scaffolded. So talking about that form of assessment is that it can be done like just shortly after um, reading week, um, they could have their first draft done, they could get feedback from their peers, and then they could revise it for a final submission. Um, the key thing that we found with peer review is it allows students to critically engage with other students' uh, material, and the best outcome is that it forces them to look at what the criteria is for the assignment. A lot of times there's a little bit of um, last minute, oh, I forgot to see what I was supposed to do. What were the requirements for that? But when you are evaluating somebody else's, and you have to look at that rubric or you have to look at those guidelines, it makes it um, pretty explicit. And it, so we found that it actually improves um, your own submission by, by peer evaluating other people's submission. And there is also a peer effect. So when you make it, uh, when it's not just between me and you, the instructor and the student, and it's actually other students seeing it, there's a little bit of a, oh, well, I don't want to be embarrassed in front of my peers. So there's a peer effect that improves the quality as well. So if this is something that you're considering, uh, it, it does have a lot of bef benefits. Um, but just like I said, you have to build in time for it because it requires a process. You need to allow time to get done, this, the, whatever the, is being peer reviewed. Then you need to allow time for the review to happen. And then ideally, you use that as something to, um, to revise and, and complete. Um, so that there's some kind of uh, final submission. And I'll just show you some of the tools that are available for this. So the assignment tool does have a little checkbox that allows you to do a peer assessment. Uh, the pro is that it works really well if everybody submits on time. That's a big if. Um, and it does provide an average grade, so it can auto grade. You can be like, yep, that's the grade for this assignment, and that's really convenient. Um, the huge um, disadvantage, in my opinion, and I mean this is huge, um, is that you don't see the submissions during the review period and if any one of your students do not get their first submission in then they're cut out of the peer review process so it's kind of a high risk high stakes um, um, peer review and it's not my favorite I've tried it a, a few a few times um, in different ways and there's always always what five percent of your students who can't get that that submission in on time and then you can't it actually locks it so you can't really open it up without redoing the whole thing so it causes a lot of problems so uh it exists if you're one of those people who have a hard line on um submission deadlines then it will work perfect for you um but it is dangerous um you can specify how many submissions uh like how many reviews do, does each student need to do so by default it's set to one but you could set three or five depending on how big your assignment is bearing in mind that if it is a large assignment uh, reviewing five is is a lot of work and you probably need to give some kind of um, grade for doing the review in addition to that um, so uh, so the question is 
peer eval? Is it easy to implement? Does it stop everyone from evaluating one student but not others? Yeah, so it randomly assigns um, who who gets evaluated and you can say how many um, submissions and how so these are all variables that you can set in the in the tool. It is easy to implement, less easy to uh, <laughs> to carry through and we're happy to work through and talk uh, specifically about your context. Um, another way is a is a little bit open, open, a lot more flexible is using the, the, the forums. So you could create groups and forums and people could post and give feedback. It's not going to auto calculate grades for you or anything, but it is a really great opportunity for students to say, hey, what do you think of this? This is what I'm working on. And they can actually kind of share some ideas back and forth. Um, and so th and that can be constrained to groups or it could be open so everybody can see everybody else's. And it's, so depending on what your outcomes are, if you really want to have uh, a numeric grade assigned, this isn't the tool for you, but this is another way that you could do peer review. Another really cool one, which we're just sort of <laughs> uh, learning about more and more because uh, uh, some of the features have changed are these student pages. So it's called student content. It's part of lessons. And for those of you who have been involved in the grad studies or the building learning communities, you'll get an opportunity to actually play around. Please let me know. I can add you to any site where you can play around and add a student page and see what this looks like. But there is a built in setting that um, so once you go to lessons, you can add your student content. But there is a built in setting here where you can click add peer review, you can create your rubric or you can use the sample rubric. Um, and there's a lot of other settings too, um, like group awareness and um, uh, uh, how, how, how much you can see of what other things are. Um, and like I said, it's, it's in emerging, I'm, I'm supporting an instructor who's teaching right now using student pages. Um, and uh, she wanted some very specific things. So we didn't use this feature. Um, but I, I'm excited to try it um, and test it a little bit deeper, but I think it has a lot of promise. Um, but the, the student pages are more of like a web page content. So it's, it's going to be like a pictures, maybe a video um, and some text. And so it depends what kind of final assignment or what kind of thing you're asking for them to be submitting. Um, and then you could also be grading that too. And, and you can take their average grade and submit that as their grade. Um, this is, uh, at least just tested, this is hot off the press of what it looks like <laughs> um, from a student perspective of how the grading, what the grading looks like, um, and then it will let the student know. I'm playing around with how much qualitative information it can give as well, because um, a key thing is not just getting a numeric grade. I think if you really want it to inform and improve, you want to have some kind of, these are some suggestions for improvement, some guidelines on what that could look like. And finally, the forms. I I love Microsoft Forms, but it was I'm using it right now to support that instructor who's using student pages. It's a class of 20. It is a lot of work to create a form for each person. I, I created one, I duplicated it, I made it, I gave them each a link for each of them, and then 20, 19 students all did the evaluation. So it was easier than doing it manually, but it was not, it's still a lot of clicking. So it is a possibility, but I would only recommend it in smaller classes. I think uh, my greatest hope right now lives in the student pages uh, for, for peer evaluation. Um, and then finally, you guys wanted to know about reflective papers and they can do all three. They can do for learning, of learning and as learning, depending on what you're looking at. So reflection, um, often, I, I mean, I went through um, the teacher ed program and it was sort of like, oh, another reflection paper, but it actually can be used as a really great opportunity to connect my prior experience, my learning with what the content is in the course. And it's so as, as I was saying about the four, as, um, or as, what are the three? <laughs> For, of, and as learning, um, you know, you can generate learning through the reflection, you can deepen the learning, and you can also document the learning. So these things can happen at these multiple levels. Uh, we have a really great resource guide that um, uh, Jen from our office created as part of the EE guidebook because reflection is built into all the experiential activities, but uh, reflection is something that can happen in every single course. It doesn't need to have a, uh, because we all have experiences, whether they're out in the community or in, in, a, in a workplace, whatever our experiences are, generating reflections can be really useful. So that link there will take you to all of the resources that I'm going to show you right now. There's some very helpful frameworks um, 
you know, the academic source calls it the literal, interpretive, and critical, but really it's just a what, now, what, so what, now what? And so the what is just sort of what happened during this course, um, and why is that relevant, and what are you going to use with that information? So that's a really simple framework that, um, I don't know if Colleen is here, but she used it in her uh, Rec and Leisure. I'm just going to call people out <laughs> randomly. Um, and I think, and uh, it, it really simplifies that, that process of thinking about what happened in the course. So a reflection can be just sort of like a one pager, or it can be a much deeper um, introspection. Another framework is the ICE framework, and it's the ideas, connections, and extensions. So if you take the ideas, you say, what, are, what were the main ideas in this course? Ask them to identify what the major themes are. How does that connect to what you've learned before in other courses? How does it connect to your own experience? How does it connect to what happened in this term? And then when you think about extension, extensions, it's sort of that, that now what? Like, what does that mean? What, how is that going to change your practice, depending on what your, um, your field is? Or how is it going to change the way that you approach this material? How, what, is, what is this in the larger context of things? Um, and I want to also point out that it can be multimodal. There's lots of different ways that you can do reflections. Um, and so we have some great examples, including assignment descriptions and um, course outlines for you to look at that are all available at this link. So um, video reflections, portfolio and showcase, um, and how, what, a, what a thought paper can look like. And just uh, calling back to last week, these things can all be integrated. So using video and audio, that can also be part of the reflection. Um, and we found that the reflections are most powerful when you actually allow a lot of choice, um, when people are allowed to choose how they want to demonstrate. So you set your criteria of what you need to know, how did this connect, and then let them decide how they want to do it. And that is, um, you see some really great creative outlets, people really tapping into the, into the material in ways that you would never have imagined if you had been very strict about it. Um, and then the big question is always, but how do I evaluate? So there's a sample rubric here. Um, I'm not a fan of rubrics. Oh, I'm recorded. I shouldn't say that. But <laughs> some, of, some of us don't like rubrics. Uh, I, actually, we talked about it yesterday in the large classes that sometimes people game the rubric to ensure that they get their A. And, you know, and so maybe that's not your, your ideal way to design it. But really think about what are the key criteria that you're looking for when you're designing your reflection. Um, so I always just sort of go into that A column. I'm like, I don't want to tell you what an F looks like. I want to tell you what an A looks like. And I just do a single point rubric. Um, but there's an example here. And we're always happy to work with you and talk about, OK, what are you trying to get at? Um, so I, I encourage you to uh, email Ed Dev for that kind of um, support. We're happy to work through that with you because it will be very context specific. Specific and depending on what you've done for or you're planning to do for the entire term. Ah, okay, and so now we're going to vote on what's next. Um, so these are what's left and I want to give you another example of showing you uh, forms. Um, so click here, provide your feedback. Uh, and remember, if you're ready to start building, please email EdTech because we're ready to help you start building immediately uh, all through the summer. If you're, you're like, okay, I, I know enough, I don't need to hear Julia talk anymore, <laughs> then I can start building. So please uh, let me know what you want to know about what you want to do. Next week is officially our last week, so you can vote or you can put a comment continue. And I am modeling this for you because I do want you to incorporate some kind of formative feedback uh, for yourself to let you know how your teaching is going all through the term so that you can make these minor adjustments. I have really valued your feedback and tried to incorporate as much as possible, I hope. I hope. Um, and so I'm going to stop the recording and then I'm going to open it up for us to, um, to have a chat or a discussion.